Question Why did God make us? The Penny Catechism answers that God created us to know Him, to love Him, to serve Him, and to be happy with Him forever in heaven. This indicates that true happiness is related to how we know God, how we love God how we serve him, and how we are open to the happiness that can only come from God. During a homily, one priest noticed this lady sobbing and sobbing from beginning to end. In the mind of the preacher, he was so happy as his message was so touching, so real, and so practical to this lady that he went on preaching and preaching. After the Mass, the priest trapped and encountered this lady to know what was so touching that she cried throughout the sermon, even till the end of the Mass. The lady answered, Father, from the moment I saw you and your overgrown beards, I remember my goat, which was stolen last week, and that is why I have been crying since then. The priest was so happy before, presuming that he was doing the best, and falsely interpreting the sobbing of this lady as the joy that accompanies the charismatic preaching. Sometimes we may be happy about something, while others are not. Sometimes, again, we may be happy for a particular thing, and the very next moment, our attitude from the same thing or circumstance is far away from happy. This points to the fact that happiness is not directly connected with created places, positions, things, people, or title, but from a Christian perspective, it is directly related to the, a person, the person of Jesus Christ. That may explain again why St. Augustine says our hearts are restless until they rest in God. The way to true happiness is reflected in the golden rule, which for Christianity states that one should do to others only that which one wishes to be done to oneself in order to be eternally happy. Luke chapter 6 verse 31. In this same life, Confucius states that one should not wish what one does not wish for self to be done to others. Still related to this idea of the other, the relationship with the other being a source of happiness. Islam also puts a similar thought this way. None of you is a believer so long as he does not wish for the brother that which he wishes for himself. In like manner, Shabarata the eighth stated that one should not behave towards the neighbor in any way which is not good for oneself. That is the essence of the moral life. Still in the same vein, Samuta Nikaya stated that any circumstance which is not comfortable or happy for me 
should not also be happy and or comfortable for him. And a situation which is neither comfortable nor happy for me, how can I create such for another? So happiness is still connected with the way we relate with the other, the way we treat the other. And still connected with this in our relationship with each other and our happiness, Rabbi Hillel in Shabbat 31a opines that one should not do to the other what one does not wish to be done to oneself. All these were religions and such sources or searches for happiness indicate one thing, that our happiness is connected with the way we relate with another. In a way, all these sayings suggest many things about humanity, among which are the following. Many religions believe that man is a social being created to relate with others. They also suggest that one will always want through one's words, thoughts, or deeds that which makes one happy and satisfied in life. In other words, these religions do not think that one can normally and or naturally hate oneself in anything that one does, that one says, that one thinks, or that one is. That means that Man naturally seeks happiness, a lasting happiness. According to James Hillman, it is the pursuit that screws up happiness. If we drop the pursuit, it is right here. Living naturally relaxed as we were created will lead us to it. There is a story of some two ladies who met in a 70-seater bus on their way to Yaoundé. And by women essence, they started uh, competing about something, material thing. It had to do with who was putting on the most expensive dress or something like that. And they quarreled in the bus and insulted each other. When they reached their destination in the bus station, they parted without greeting. Each took a taxi to her own direction. When they, when they finally reached, they discovered that one was the younger sister of the wife and one was the sister of the husband in whose house they were going. So, this was a challenge to not recognizing a human They had to reconcile because they couldn't stay in the same house, still being enemies as they were. The biblical story of creation presents a paradise state of the human being a state of no effort, no struggle, no suffering, no sickness, no conflict, no discrimination, a state of unaffected happiness. God created man and woman in his image and likeness, good and beautiful and healthy and happy. Genesis chapter 2. In this light, the Bible states that God created humanity for himself and for a paradisal life on earth. God ordered a blessing on man over the whole created world when he said, fill the earth and conquer it. This means that all created things are meant to serve man and to make him happy since he was created to be happy and to be the conqueror of creation. After the fall of Adam and Eve, due to disobedience, Everything that is not paradise came to be. The prophets and Israel longed for the lost state of paradise, and so it realized in the messianic times, when all that is not happiness will have been in the past, as Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17 following states. Jesus then comes as an ideal human being and actually conquers all created things, as he says. In the world, you will have trouble. But take courage. Be brave. I have conquered the world. John chapter 16. In which case, for the followers of Christ, no created thing, position, place, creature, or person may be able to reduce our happiness because we can do all things in Christ who strengthens us and who assures us that nothing is possible for him who believes. Philippians 14, Matthew 17. 
the book of Revelation will begin to see this state already realized in the life to come for the believers. Revelation chapter 21. Jesus comes in the first place to help man to regain his lost state of paradise. And he shows how man can pass through the limitations of the wounded history and the wooden world, consequence upon the fall to a state of paradise regained in the hereafter. Jesus presents a way to conquer the world, to live in the world and not be of the world in view of a lasting happiness. John chapter 15. In the Sermon on the Mount, Luke, Luke refers to it as Sermon of, of the Plain. In the Sermon, our blessed Lord considers happy the following people. Those who know that all that is good in them and through them is from God. As St. John Mary already says, everything that we have that is good is of God. The only thing that we have by right, privately, which is ours, is that which is sinful. And the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus considers happy those who are poor in spirit, those who depend on God and have only God. I was telling a story of somebody who was cheated, and when the person was cheated, he asked for permission to pray by the, first, the man who cheated him. And the man who mediated this cheating was there because they see somebody's blood and a big man came by our standard and declared that the person who was stealing the land, it belonged to him. And this person prayed and said, God, I thank you for this decision of this big man. I am not complaining. I have no government. I have no political party. I have no gender. I have no police. I have no soldier. I have only you. All I pray for is for the conversion of these type of people who seize property from the poor and give to the rich because they have bribed them. This big man for once could not sleep after receiving bribe. And he came to a priest to ask for assistance. It was because the poor man had no one. So those who are poor in spirit, those who know that they depend only on God for everything, they have no Godfather, they have only God. Jesus says those people are happy. Those who are mindful of their de dependence on the mercy of God. Those who know that we live only by mercy. Because John Mary again will tell us, he says that heaven goes by grace, by mercy and not by merit. We are to go by merit, dogs will go in and leave us out. Jesus again says, those who are happy are those who mourn, who acknowledge, who recognize and who cry for their sins. Through confession, through reconciliation, and through forgiveness. Those who are happy, according to Jesus, are those who are mindful of their creature status. Those who are humble. Those who desire and who desire the food and do the, the will of God as the food for their lives always. Jesus considers happy those who forgive with the attitude of Jesus. Those who are unconditionally merciful. Those who have pure motivation and crucified drives in their compassionate reaction to life, those are happy. Those who speak, who think and act in the direction of peace. Those who embrace innocent suffering with an admirable Christ-like calmness. And those who manifest resilience in the face of the hero's suffering. These are realities which to the worldly minded reflect weakness, but wish to Christ reflect strength. Happiness in the life of a Christian draws from the foolishness of the world because of Jesus. In this line, Basil Hill reminds priests that ours is a wonderful vocation, and we must be proud to be priests. It must be evident to others that we are proud of our priesthood and that we treasure especially our responsibility in the Word of God, in the sacraments, and quite especially in the Eucharist and the sacrament of confession. People instinctively recognize what it means to us. They know if we love the Word of God. They know if we love the sacrament. They know if we love the Mass." Unquote. But the view is here suggesting that 
when we do our ministry of charity and the ministry of the word and sacrament, we will have fulfillment, provided we do it the right way, in the right circumstances, and, in the right, and to the right people. <coughs> Reflecting on the Beatitudes, Kotonshin says that Christ takes those eight flimsy catchwords of the world, security, revenge, <coughs> laughter, popularity, getting even, sex, armed might, and comfort, and turns them upside down. To those who say, you cannot be happy unless you are rich, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. To those who say, don't let him get away with it, he says, blessed are the patient. To those who say, laugh and the world laughs with you, he says, blessed are those who mourn. To those who say, if nature gave you sex instincts, you ought to give them free expression, otherwise you will become frustrated, he says, blessed are the clean of heart. To those who say, seek to be popular and well known, he says, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and speak all manner of evil against you falsely because of you. <coughs> to those who say, in time of peace, prepare for war, he says, blessed are the peacemakers, quoted Shin in his book, Life of Christ. Someone has observed that saints are happy because they have nothing, because they need nothing, because they wish for nothing, and are attached to nothing. This description almost describes the happiness of our blessed Lord, whose, whose whole food was to do the will of the Father. What gave Jesus happiness was doing the will of the Father from the moment of the incarnation through the Paschal mystery. As it were, he left his eternal dwelling within the Trinity and borrowed this earth to become man. As it were, our blessed Lord borrowed human nature, which he didn't have before. He borrowed human parents. He borrowed a table, a stable to be born in. He had no way to lay his head. He borrowed a boat to preach the message of the kingdom. He borrowed bread and fish to multiply. He borrowed a coin from the fish to pay tax to Caesar. He borrowed a donkey to ride triumphal to Jerusalem. He borrowed a room to institute the great sacrament of the Eucharist. He borrowed Simon's soldiers to rest from the weight of the cross. He borrowed Veronica's veil to wipe his face. And finally, he borrowed the tomb in which he was buried, so far as this was in line with what God the Father realized. He borrowed everything. He lived on borrowed earth. He lived on borrowed road. This intimate that happiness for a priest of Christ is directly connected to the attitude of attachment to or detachment from worldly ways of thinking, acting, possessing, or being. Chin again observes that all false beatitudes which make happiness depend on self-expression, license, having a good time, he scorns because they bring mental disorders, unhappiness, false hopes, fears, and anxieties. God the Father created us out of love, to be holy, to be healthy, and to be happy with Him in His image and likeness, and to finally be with Him forever in heaven. This happiness flows from a constant mindfulness of the purpose of our creation, which is summarized in knowing God, loving God, serving Him, and longing for Him in all that we do, all that we say, all that we think, and in all that we are. In this life, St. Paul exhorts us to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Philippians 4 verse 4. St. Paul is asking us here to be happy always. And the Catechism will tell us that God created us to know Him, to love Him, to serve Him, and to be happy with Him always. So God created us to be happy. As priests, how and where and when can we be happy always? Our happiness should be connected with Christ the High Priest. Those for whom we work and our relationship with the world 
to which we assent with the message of the good news. Good news is always accompanied by happiness and joy, as for Francis would say. And since we are aided with the good news, our happiness should flow from the object, content, and aim of the good news, and this is Jesus Christ alone. We live in a bad news society. We live in a bad news world. We have bad news against priests. Bad news against the church makes good news for the media. So, in a, good news, in a bad news world, a priest should be like a candle in darkness. The source of hope, the source of good news. Experience has proven that happiness sought in creatures cannot be lasting. Seeing the same thing that gives one a semblance of happiness can in the next minute be the same cause of unhappiness. And also, since creatures that give happiness to one may not bring it to another. In this life, she again opines that the Sermon on the Mount is so much at variance with all that our world holds dear, that the world will crucify anyone who tries to live up to its values as this Christ. Because Christ preached them, he had to die. Calvary was the price he paid for the Sermon on the Mount. Only mediocrity survives. Those who call black, black, and white, white, are sentenced for intolerance. Only the greys live. We live in a world where behind or blinded or disguised as diplomacy or prudence, some people have embarked mediocrity and sacrificed integrity. Such in the demon relate the parable of a person who in the course of dying, wanted to know where he was to go. And what did the God of rebirth tell him? Say you would go to where you belonged, in the sense that what you build on earth, you will harvest in the next life. And this man was sad, because what you build on earth, he wouldn't want to go back to it. So, happiness for a Christian and for a priest at that cannot come from creative things. It cannot come from the worldly things. It cannot come from positions. It can come only from a person. Mindful of the fact that happiness for a Christian is different from the worldly minded, Futonshin further relates the cross to the happy life thus. The Beatitudes cannot be taken alone. They are not ideals. They are hard facts and realities inseparable from the cross of Calvary. What Jesus taught was self-crucifixion, to love those who hate us, to love those who hate us, to plug our eyes and cut off arms in order to prevent sinning. That is painful. To be clean on the inside when the passions clamor for satisfaction on the outside. To forgive those who would put us to death, to overcome evil with good, to bless those who curse us, to stop mounting freedom until we have justice, truth, and love of God in our hearts as the condition of freedom. To live in the world and still keep oneself unpolluted from it. To deny ourselves sometimes legitimate pleasures in order to the better to crucify our egotism. All this is to sentence the old man in us to death, put in shame. For a Christian, and for a priest therefore, happiness does not come from a reason, but from a person, an identification with that person in whose character we are baptized and engaged. As we said before, the happiness that comes from Christ will come also, or will show itself also, with the scars of witnessing for Christ. The scars of being ready or actually dying completely naked and completely innocent. In this life, someone is of the opinion that happiness is your nature. It is not wrong to desire it. What is wrong is seeking it outside when it is inside. In your created image, good and beautiful and healthy, in God's image. Nearly all mankind is more or less unhappy because nearly all do not know the true self. 
Real happiness abides in self-knowledge alone. If you know yourself who you are, know your dignity, know the treasure within you, you will have every reason to be happy. All else is fleeting. To know oneself is to be blissful always. This opinion is close to the Christian opinion that we are created in God's image and knowing and living out this image rightly leads to happiness. Someone has observed that we make a living by what we have and make life by, by what we give. So, to be happy in this sense is to be grateful. When we are grateful, we will be happy. When we look for every reason to be grateful, that reason will make us happy. And we always have a reason to be, happy, to be, happy, to be grateful. And this is the fact that we are still alive. What does not kill us, Jota says, strengthens us. We have some problems that some people with those many problems have died, but we are still alive. So we should be happy. We should be happy that something that has happened to others and killed them has happened to us and we are still moving. That is a reason to be happy. Some people would have wished to be with us now and they are not there. Because of, the, of no fault of theirs. For that reason, we should be happy. We have to be happy that we can talk and somebody will hear. We can get up from bed. We can have what to eat. We can even have the, the teeth to eat with. We can even choose something. Some people do not have. If we look for reasons to be happy, we will, I mean, to be grateful, we will always be happy. And we will hardly have space to complain. Someone again goes on to find that every living being longs always to be happy. Or tainted by sorrow. And everyone has the greatest love for himself, which is solely due to the fact that happiness is his real nature. Greed is the abuse of self-love. Egotism is the ab abuse of self-love. And these are among the things we identify in ourselves. Hence, in order to realize that inherent and untainted happiness, which indeed he daily experiences when the mind is subdued in deep sleep, it is essential that he should know himself. Socrates has said, to be happy, man, know thyself. In this connection, Carl Jung is convinced that your vision will become clear only when you look into your heart. Who looks outside dreams? Who looks inside awakens? And that is the essence of a retreat, to look inside. To look inside myself in order to awaken to the dignity to the reality, to the worth, to the value that is within me. Look inside. And we have this value which is inalienable. It cannot be taken away from us. Everything else can be taken away from us. But the worth, the worth that we have. Let me, let me give an example now to let us see a little bit of reason to be happy. Let us imagine that all of us in this hall can do everything, can do everything humanly possible to have money. We're imagining, so you can decide not to imagine, it's alright, but let us imagine that we can do anything to have money. If I hold 10,000 Cameroon francs here, who would like to take it? Put up your hand. Zero. Okay? Look at it. I'm holding it. We're imagining I'm holding it. I'm holding 10,000 francs. I'm spitting on it. Who would still like it? I'm smashing on it. Who would still like it? Fine. Whether I do well with 10,000 francs, you still want it. Why? Because the value remains. That is No matter what we do to ourselves, no matter how we rubbish ourselves, he is seeing the value in us and waiting for us to come back home to our senses, to our being, and celebrate the treasure within us. That is the awakening that comes when we go inside to see that we are worth more than the whole world. And that is why Pope Francis will say, as it was in the beginning, is now. Human life is irreplaceable. Human, nobody has a right to do away with human life from conception to natural death. Because from beginning to the end of the world, the word of God says, Thou shalt not kill. Because God took time. As Psalm 139 will say, I need you. He needs you in your mother's womb. God has a particular attention for everybody. And so we have to be happy, at least for that reason. We are not accidents. There is no accidental human being. 
we were all created on a Monday with the best material after a long week and rest. So, this demands that one has a pure motivation always, though this does not preclude the possibility of misunderstanding. Pure motivation signifies that whatever we do, our every action to be motivated by our desire to replicate Christ, to please God. As for human approval, it means not. If you are in your heart of heart, it is to please God, to act like Christ, to help, to benefit others without expecting any worldly return. Happiness is as close to us as water is to the fish. When we look for it outside, then we become like fish looking for water outside where it lives. When one misses out his natural value and offer of happiness, he becomes like a fish dying out of thirst of water in the sea. Expectations may be high from us, but all that we are sharing here is the fruit of the life experiences and learning of many people. We are sharing here in this happiness universal and timeless truth. I dare say with Montaigne that it might well be said of me that here I have only made up a bunch of other people's flowers and provided nothing of my own but a string to bind them together. There was one of our teachers in the seminary who sometimes will evaluate a person's seminar paper with things like, the only thing linking this work is the pin. <laughs> and when we say, how? Uh, Father, how can you, how can you do that? He said, anyhow, the word is, is used. So at least the word is, is also linking the work. It can happen. <laughs> but for a human being, the only thing linking us to our happiness is our creation, the image and likeness of God, which cannot be taken away from us. On one occasion, a neighbor found Mola Nashuri down on his knees, looking for something. What have you lost, Mola? My keys, said Nashuri. After a few minutes of searching, the neighbor said, Where did you drop them? He said, Inside my home. Then why, for heaven's sake, are you looking here? Because there is more light here said the Mula. You kept something somewhere else, you are searching for it somewhere else because there is more light where you are searching. That's what happens when we are looking for happiness from creatures, positions, places, instead of looking for happiness from where it is supposed to be. The light outside the home in this story could be the shadowy creatures of worldliness which may distract us from searching for happiness in the essence of the priesthood of Christ. In this light, Paul Bezekon once told us that any priest whose happiness is sought for outside the Holy Eucharist and the sacrament of confession has much to reflect on his vocation. This can be seen in an implicit or explicit morbid desire for fame, power, position, titles, honor, pleasure, and wealth. Sometimes I begin to wonder when you hear some good news about a priest, I wonder, have we ever heard that Christians say that priest is so wonderful because he had a wonderful car? No. Have you said that priest is so wonderful because he lives in a wonderful house? No. What makes a Christian see a priest wonderful is the pastor in him. If the priest is pastoral, is fatherly a pastor, the Christian appreciate that and they cannot describe that in words. So, like priests, like priest, our happiness should also come from our work and not from the accident of fame, power, position, titles, honor, pleasure, where our language is a language of sanctioning. We use the sacerdotal hammer. I think somebody referring to an episcopal hammer that made him in his parish. But this is sacerdotal. There's a story of a priest. Who never followed instructions. He never gave his monthly account. He never went for meetings. He never did anything. He was running a diocese in his little parish. And one day the bishop planned to visit him 
and inform him. And people of the neighboring parishes, the priests were happy that they have planned to go visit the priest. And were wanting to see what he will do. But they saw him not worry. The bishop was to come on a third day for a one week visitation. The bishop arrived on Thursday evening at 4 o'clock, and this priest was in the chapel. They came and tapped him. That bishop has arrived. He came out. He said, My Lord, welcome. Welcome. Let's go. Uh, I will pray, so let's just go. Uh, show him a room. I said, Let me go and finish. Because every Thursday, the, he, he's always overwhelmed and overtaken by the mystery of the priesthood institution of Holy Thursday. <laughs> and so he told adoration every Thursday. He told her, My son, my son, I just came to explain your reality. So she talked to her, We hate you from outside. We don't know what is happening. She went with the bishop to the chapel. The bishop sat before the blessed sacrament. Over time passed. Night prayer passed. Eight night, they were still there. <laughs> Say, no, my Lord, normally I don't, I fast because there's a big mystery. But if you want food, I can prepare for you. Say, no, don't pray, don't pray, my son. No, I don't want to give you a reality. <laughs> the next morning, very early, I was already making the back of the chapel. <laughs> <laughs> the bishop prayed, they prayed, prayed, and prayed. After 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, night, the bishop said, no, pray for them. No, my son, my Lord, I don't, I, I don't fast. Get to the mystery of Calvary. You can't get out of that picture on a Friday. The bishop went out, went to the office, and paced through the registers. And by midday, the bishop was over and was driving away. And went to a neighboring parish, singing the praises of this priest. The priest is very serious. The bishop holds over the registers and is worried to meet lunch in the next parish. <laughs> so that evening, all the priests in that uh, environment came to visit this man. And they, they, they were happy. He entertained them very well. And then they said, Brother, can you tell us the secret? Because we have never seen our bishop so happy with a priest. He said, No. That type can only be driven out with prayer and fasting. When I heard this story, <laughs> When I heard this story, I didn't believe until Cardinal took me in a similar way. <laughs> <laughs> the time, the time that we give us a little prayer. <laughs> so, my dear friend of God, Aristotle says that happiness is the meaning and purpose of life, the whole aim and end of human existence. <laughs> in this same line, Ralph Waldo Emerson is convinced. That nothing can bring you happiness but yourself. And for the priest, this happiness can only rightly flow from our relationship with the high priest, with our boss, in whose footsteps we are ordained to work. There is something wrong with everybody and also with you. Your happiness can only come from you and your relationship with Christ. When there is food, there is too much food. When there is no food, there is no food. So when you put in dark glasses, you see darkness everywhere. If you put on a glass of complaining, you see everything to complain. Say, man, if you want to see everything to celebrate, you will always see it. Perception is very important in our search for happiness. You may ask me this question. How do I see goodness in a person who has everything that is not Christian, that is not charity, everything that is not love. How do I see Christ in such a person in order to be happy? Christ has many faces. Not only the joyful, not only the glorious, not only the luminous. He has also the sorrowful face. See the face of Christ, the sorrowful face of Christ in that difficult situation, in that difficult person, and you will be happy. A big cat saw a little cat chasing its tail and asked, Why are you chasing your tail so? Said the kitten. I have learned that the best thing for a cat is happiness, and that happiness is my tail. Therefore, I am chasing it, and when I catch it, I shall have happiness. The old cat laughed and said, My son, have paid attention to the problems of the universe. I too have judged that happiness is my tail. 
But I have noticed that whenever I chase it, it keeps running away from me. And when I go about my business, it just seems to come after me wherever I go. This goes in line with the will of God, the aspect of the will of God, which was for us to live the present moment. To live each moment as if it were the first moment for us to live as children of God, as if it were the only moment we had to live as children of God, as if it were the last moment we had to live as children of God. What will we do? What shall we be doing if that were the case? Empirical research shows that we can increase our happiness as much as 40% by intentionally engaging in activities such as, this is a recipe for increasing happiness, gratitude, actions of gratefulness. I am not talking here of platitudes. Talk of real gratitude, gratefulness. You know when you go and thank somebody to get something. Detached gratitude. <laughs> Doing random acts of kindness can increase your happiness. And creating a sense of optimism. This demands being altruistic in our daily acts of love. I always like to read the experiences of my friend, Father Miss Santan. One day he bought a, a letter from Jahiri to his village, his village between South and Ubo. And when he entered the taxi, he started praying his rosary, and the people were not happy with him. They said, This man all the time praying, praying, praying. He continued praying. They came and reached somewhere where he was supposed to alight, and the driver did not stop. He just passed with Father Santa. Father continued praying. When they reached the park and drove, Father knelt down and thanked the driver. <laughs> then he had a patient here, he was thinking, How they ever have transport to come to Kubo and visit the patient? And we are really healthy. <laughs> that was so disappointing. <laughs> so you, you can make a happy situation out of every situation. Eh? Try to see a good reason for what is happening and be happy. According to Bertrand Russell, the secret of happiness is this let your interests be as wide as possible, and let your reactions to the things and persons that interest you. Be as fast as possible, friendly, rather than hostile. In this connection, many traditions share the condition that the road to lasting happiness is paved by a selfless, caring concept for others. Real happiness comes from altruistic acts. It is cultivated by harnessing our intrinsic goodness, by developing the spiritual qualities of mind and heart, qualities of kindness and compassion, gratitude and altruism. In Buddhist psychology, if a man speaks or acts with a pure thought, happiness follows him like a shadow that never leaves him. This suggests that sometimes we do not get happy or we are not happy because of our hidden agenda. This suggests too that the choice to be happy is deliberate and is from a mental disposition. If we are sincere to ourselves and to others, it will lead to happiness. In this slide, John Milton says that the mind in its own place can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. So, whether you believe that you can be happy or that you cannot, whether you think that you can be happy or that you cannot, you will always be right. Everyone can take responsibility for his happiness or the lack thereof. In this slide, Huxley shares the conviction that there is only one corner of the universe you can be certain of improving, and that is your own self. A retreat gives one the opportunity of this improvement of self. From his limited experience of disappointment and failure in the pursuit of happiness in the direction of created things, Thomas Hardy concludes subjectively that happiness is but a mere episode in the general drama of pain. This could be right when one makes one's longing for happiness to depend on creatures, people, opinions, positions, or titles 
unless he is the model of the universe, where you make your life the circumference of the whole universe. Emmanuel Kant's second categorical imperative states that conduct is right if it treats others as ends in themselves and not as means to an end. This is very important. From this, it seems that if we are helping others in order to benefit ourselves as means to an end, even if this end is immediately the happiness that flows from such to us, then it becomes a business transaction and our motivation is a little less Christian. To be alive is to be grateful for everything, for our incoming and outgoing breath, just the fact that we can breathe, for the wonder of blood circulating in our veins, we can be grateful, for the refreshing joy of a good night's sleep, even for a good bath, Gary, we can be grateful. <laughs> For the amazing gift of the beauty of the rising sun. It's an eighth avenue to be beautiful, to be grateful. The sunshine and the sunset. You can be grateful for a rainbow, for the beautiful scenery of the mountains and vegetation, for the free air, for the variety in God's creation. Our happiness should simply flow from our being alive. Things others in our circumstances and with our qualifications and talents could not make it thus far. There are better people than us in the cemeteries. So we should be happy that we are still alive. We still have another chance to change. Selfless service has generally been regarded by many religious traditions as a means to happiness. Since there is more joy in giving than in receiving, Abed Schweitzer says, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I know, the only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. In this life, Jesus would invite his listeners to stretch themselves out on a cross, to find happiness on a higher level by death to a lower, a lower order, to despise all the world holds sacred, and to venerate as sacred all the world regards as an ideal. <coughs> Heaven is happiness. But it is too much for men to have two heavens, an ersatz one below and a real one above. I'm quoting to Christian here. To grow towards true happiness, one needs to accept oneself as I am and accept others as they are. The self is common to all, but the I is unique to us. When Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, He's, he's indicating and highlighting two things. The common self, which is the creation in God's image and likeness of, of everybody, and the uniqueness, which is that particular act of your creation, where the psalm says, he needs me in my mother's womb. So love as yourself. It's not to love like yourself. Love the self as yourself because the, he is a human being like you. But unfortunately, sometimes, we are tempted to love by the human doings and not the being. So, to love as the self. The self is common to all. As long as there is any aspiration to be like or better than someone else, life remains a struggle away from real happiness. I want to repeat that. As long as there is any aspiration to be better than someone else, Life remains a struggle far, far away from real happiness. Happiness will only come when we try to be better than ourselves in the knowledge of ourselves and the treasure within us which is inalienable. When we look, for instance, at the word business, we notice that the you comes before the I in the spelling of business. We also notice that the eye is silent. This could be a gentle hint that in whatever business of the day, be it of the Lord or the world, or of the hour, we find ourselves in not only our own motive, we find, we find ourselves in not only having our own motive secondary, but in serving others. But it should also not be too loud the I in me. 
Business is like a game of tennis. In order to win, one has to be good at service. So is the business of happiness. In order to win, we have to be good at service. Service to the happiness. A Chinese saying indicates that a little perfume stays with the hand that gives flowers to others. And where I come from, there's also a saying about Kamu, that you don't rub the fawn or you don't anoint the king with Kamu and leave your hands, rub your hands on the soil. You rub them on yourself. So when you give dignity, when you give respect, when you give love, you receive love. What goes around comes around. <clears throat> when Socrates urges man to know thyself in order to be really happy, Plato will say that an unexamined life is not worth living. Victor Frankl is a medical doctor who found himself in the Nazi concentration camp. He observes that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, <coughs> the last of human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. This means that whether we believe that a particular circumstance will make us happy or we believe that it will not make us happy, we are always right, as I said before. From this, in the area of happiness, we can begin to summarize our idea that I, if not of me, I would have been happy. Raglai believes that there is no greater difference between people than between grateful and ungrateful people. That's the only difference between human beings, grateful and ungrateful. And grateful people are happy people. In the same life, Cicero says that gratitude is not only the greatest of the virtues, but the parent of all others. In this life, Charles Dickens is of the opinion, reflect on your present blessings, of which every man has many, not on your past misfortune, of which all men have some. According to Melody Bietti, gratitude unlocks the fullness of life. It turns what we have into enough and more. It turns denial into acceptance. It turns chaos to order. It turns confusion to clarity. Gratitude can turn a meal into a feast. Gratitude can turn a house into a home. Gratitude can turn a stranger into a friend. Gratitude makes sense of our past brings peace for today, and create a vision for tomorrow. There is also a wise saying that gratitude is double happiness because it blesses both the giver and the receiver. One needs to be grateful simply for the wonder of creation. I read something somewhere that for every human form of life, there are billions of other life forms on this earth. Humans live Humans live on land that covers, human beings, they live on land that covers roughly 30% of the Earth's surface. And the mighty oceans cover the remaining 70% of Earth's surface. However, the creatures that live in the ocean vastly outnumber those on land. When we compare the number of humans to the overwhelming number of other species on Earth, we come to understand why human population is referred to as the speck of sun on the fingernail in creation. Imagine that the whole human population is just like a speck of sun on the fingernail in the universe. Where is the place of pride? The universe can still be without us. This reality should all strike one into gratefulness and humility. Especially mindful of the fact that as scriptures say, God the creator has a particular attention to each of us, insignificant in the ocean of the universe as we may seem to ourselves and to the world he minded. A few small colonies of ants can easily outnumber the entire population of the human race on earth. I mean, these are things that should make us grateful that we are alive. A New York Times magazine expresses this more clearly in an article where it states that there are more intestinal bacteria in your colon at this moment in your body 
that there are human beings who have ever lived. Imagine that. <laughs> in your colon, that the human beings who have ever lived in the whole history of humanity. In this connection, a Hindu wisdom text of Vedanta states that among various living creatures on earth, being born as a human being is rare, very rare. <laughs> For those who believe in happiness from creatures, science has shown that in the whole created order, human beings are the only creatures, please take note, human beings are the only creatures who drink when they are not thirsty and who eat when they are not hungry. Every other creature drinks to quench the thirst and be happy or eats to be satisfied. It's only human beings who drink when they are not thirsty. These truths should arouse us to a sense of gratitude for our own lives and a more sense of respect and value for the lives of others as this will remind us that the place to be happy is here. The time to be happy is now. And the way to be happy is like Christ to make others happy. So let us pray that God should lead us not into the temptation of happiness. That God lead us not into the temptation to be unhappy. Do not allow us to fall into the temptation to be unhappy. Be with us in moments of temptation to be unhappy. Especially when the temptation to be unhappy in the Lord's vineyard comes to us. When we ask for this and are actually open to the grace to avoid people, places, and things that can lead us to sin and unhappiness, then and only then can we be happy as God intended us to be. As someone has said already, the place to be happy is here. Amen. The time to be happy is now. And the way to be happy is to make others happy. Let those who hope in you not be put to shame through me, Lord of hosts. Amen. Let not those who seek you be dismayed through me, God of Israel. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send down your spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all people, that we may be preserved from degeneration, disaster, and war, especially in the English Cameroons. May the Lady of all nations, the Blessed Virgin Mary, be our advocate forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, now, and ever shall be, Lord of Our Lady Refuge of Sinners, our Lady Seat of Wisdom, our Lady Health of the Sick, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.